<laughs> when I'm doing like interviews yeah. and they're like, how can you like connect with teenagers? Mm. And I was like, the last thing a teenager wants is like a mm. relatively successful mm. other teenager being like, I get sad sometimes as well, guys. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little bit sad. That's a big thing, no, though. Is it like the tropey mental health of people? You kind of have to come out and say that you've had something, you know? I know. Else? And then sometimes I'm like, well, I'm actually still in therapy trying to work yeah. through. I don't want to tell you that I'm depressed <laughs> yet. Well, you don't want to go too deep. Yeah, you know, because, and like then you can't because then I'm like, and then they want me to be a beacon of hope as well. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm also very sad and hate myself, but it does get better. <laughs> I don't know that yet, but someone else does. <laughs> So Liv, you and I essentially, we met on TikTok. Yeah. That's what happened. I think the first video I saw from you was one about Steiner. Probably. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, another st- a fellow Steiner. Because they're, they're hard to come by. Yeah. They're rare. People listening are probably like, what's a Steiner <laughs> school? So Steiner school's like a cult. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon half my stand up is talking about Steiner school being a cult. <laughs> it's, cr- it's actually, and the more, and you just, when you start mm. talking about it, there are just so many little components that yeah. just like freak people out. Like our winter solstice. like The lanterns. The lanterns. The autumn one where you carry the apples in a circle. Did yeah. you do that one? We did Crazy. the one where, because at Columbia College, like you were across the road from the commission flat. So like we'd be walking through with lanterns past like people <laughs> yeah. just passing out yeah. on drugs <laughs> and being like, what's happening? And I feel like, you know what's <laughs> awful? We all look down, all the other Steiner schools look down on Collingwood College because you sure. also had the mainstream and we're like, yeah. I'm not a real Steiner school. <laughs> we also had Reggio, Amelia. What? It's like a different stream of education. Ugh. So we had three. We had the mainstream, we had the sign, we had the Reggio. And you didn't have Montessori? No. no. That's Did ridiculous. We? I don't think so. But we play footy matches against <laughs> each other. Like, I'm not sure. It was like very depending, tribal. Depending on the... It is. It Did you have to go to the Greek Olympics? We never went to the oh. Greek Olympics, I don't think. So you had to, Greek <laughs> Olympics was in year seven. You had to go in a toga and yeah. play like shot. <laughs> so just imagine all these like little kids just like, you know... Yeah. Either going through puberty or prepubescent, just like running around in togas yeah. with then like our normal clothes underneath <laughs> and sandals. Or did you go on the crazy school camps? Yeah, we They'd did. They'd like send us out into the forest by ourselves for like a week. <laughs> in like year six or year seven, I had to canoe through the Yarra River yeah. with all of my belongings in like, I don't know, what are they, like a barrel. Mm. That's so awful. Like I was on my pit. That's an awful thing to do to a young girl I think my who brother- doesn't really enjoy <laughs> camping. I think my brother got close to Diet's Falls. Like, he was, like, <laughs> near where there's, like, a pretty pathetic waterfall, <laughs> but it's still scary. <laughs> All these kids wearing felt and trying to yeah, paddle back. paddle! <laughs> oh, God. So you get onto Little Lunch, and then what happens then? So you're cast. How many years are you on Little Lunch for? So filming was, like, a year, and then it was an awesome show. Wayne, Hope, and Robin Butler are, like, two fantastic writers and actors in general, and the way that they... It was an awesome, just it was awesome for so many reasons, like being around other kids as well. So we were all acting together. Mm. We all were so invested in our characters. We got really fundamental teaching components of comedy. Like they would say to us, oh, okay, what what in this line is funny? How are you going to do the delivery of this line that's funny? And then maybe they'd be like, see, this is funny. And they'd get the cast, the, the crew to laugh like after a take. And so it was so consistently <laughs> affirming. And then we all developed like our own kind of little comedy traits through that character that has definitely carried on for me because I was so affirmed that, yes, what you're doing is funny. You've got the character right. You know the lines. I'm going to give you creative flow now. And as a child, that's so wonderful. Like having an adult, put their time and trust into you and then love what you pr- what what you make is so like has kind of set me up for my confidence kind of consistently for all comedy that I do um yeah and then it ended and then so that when we did like 26 episodes and then I had just gone on to home and away and little lunch had come out and just kind of completely mm. taken Australia by storm um it had such a pos- positive reaction which was so lovely mm. and then I was on home and away and then they wanted to film kind of two two or three special episodes and then that was crazy. I was 13 and I would fly from Sydney to Melbourne every day filming two different shows. Wow. So I filmed Home and Away like Monday, Little Lunch Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then come back Saturday, Sunday. At this point you're not doing school or you're doing it like online? Just doing it online. I think if I'm being completely honest with the online things, from year seven to year eight, I didn't really do any schoolwork. And yeah. then year 10, nine, 10, I didn't really either. Um, it just wasn't feasible. It was for me to continue. And then when I got on Home and Away, like all of them were adults. I didn't really have any young people. Mm. So on Home and Away, kind of me going to school was actually just to have 
conversations with people <laughs> my age, so I wasn't walking around like this really weird, messed up, yeah. middle-aged woman <laughs> as a 13-year-old. Were they protective? Like, were the people on Little Lunch and, like, Home and Away, like, I always wonder that when you enter into a show, like, do people look out for one another or is there a competitive aspect with actors and actresses? How does it work? So I think Little Lunch was both protective and healthy competition of us all being young and wanting to do really well, and that community was really lovely. Home and Away, I was the youngest, so I was very looked after because I was this baby and my character had come in with a foster family and we were a new family, so we all really looked out for each other. And then I worked very directly with Emily Simons, who really kind of sheltered and looked after me, which was really beautiful. Um, I think there probably is some competition in that classic, you know, 25 to 30 or 20 to 30 range when you're a newcomer and you're the new bombshell and then there's another one and what rating is getting higher for those characters because, you, mm. you know, you'll be put on screen more... It's like a rating thing. If you're a favourite character, they'll give you more shit to do. That's so <laughs> interesting. But I think because I was young and I was yeah. in my own little metaverse and I was this yeah. thing. And then even if like um, co-stars came on who were kind of playing teenagers as well, they were still older than me. Mm. Like I still was the youngest and kind of in my own category. So I didn't really get very jealous because I was doing kind of – I was the only one really doing that. So that was really fine and fun and crazy. Like, you know, I worked like 60 – hours a week yeah and just like you know it was an awesome experience for so many components and really is like an acting school you know you're learning like 10 pages of lines a day something might change you're going you're driving like six hours a day like from you know 4 a.m in the morning to go to location to drive back to the studio maybe to drive back to location again then to go home you've got to learn lines in the car stuff's changing you know you're doing only like two or three takes because there's such a quick turnover so I learned so much and I think it really made me a professional um, and then that really assisted me in America because I was so professional and I knew what to do. And kind of in everything, it's really been able to give me a step up. I can walk on set and be massively professional. Mm. And it also taught me the respect of how hard everyone else in the casting crew was working. Like, you know, the cameramen are there for two hours before you and then editing are there six hours after you. And so it's such a communal thing. And yes, Home and Away gets some flack of like what it is, but the people work so hard on it. I kind of can never bag it. Yeah. Because it's just like. Because <laughs> you've seen what goes into it. Yeah. You're and like, this guy's been editing work, yeah, for uh, five hours. <laughs> yeah. And everyone, like, if some of them have been there for like 25 years yeah. in the same studio every day and they're never pissy. Yeah. Like, the, you know, everyone is so hardworking. It's never a shit atmosphere. Like, mm. sometimes people are tired or it's a low atmosphere, mm. but it's always a positive space. And I'm like, you can't, like, it is, it, it's an aesthetic in itself. <laughs> Um, do you find pressure like with with media portrayals like when you're talking like you are you talk to magazines and things like do they ever say hey we want this scoop or we want this to happen or I think I'm pretty podcasts are kind of where I let loose because a lot of the time (laughs) podcasts are with my friends or people I like or want to speak with yeah magazines more so especially in Australia they are pretty cookie cutter Mm. and um I think because of the home and away legacy that I hold and the Disney legacy as well they actually don't like getting dirty scoops on me which is great I don't particularly have anything to hide and I haven't done anything morally bad but they don't actually want like a the more the most they really want for me is how how my mental health was affected when I'm like with online bullying that's kind of the extent of it um which is yeah really fucked up and has really really affected me but Mm. I think as a whole I I haven't really done anything enough I'm not crazy enough as a person (laughs) that people are particularly interested they do like to write stories on my haircuts or on my (laughs) like if okay once I got my hair cut really short after having it long for years and years and years and they were like, everyone thinks she looks like a Karen. Everyone what? thinks she looks ugly. And I was like, cool. <laughs> and then they're like, anyways, she's on Disney, so go watch it. I don't her. know how to react to that because it's so horrible. It's awful. And then, I, yeah, I used to get like paparazzi from yeah, like 13 wonder, to like, 15. How does that happen? Like I've always wondered because the only thing I remember, Matt O'Kine, mm. who's a friend of mine, he came on the podcast and they got a little snippet, which won't happen for this, I promise, but they got a little snippet and then that was a Daily Mail article about him talking will. about Triple J and being – and I was remember like, I'm like, how did they find – like they've forensically gone over it and been like, okay, <laughs> Matt O'Kine said that, yeah. publish it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the photos don't mean just like – <laughs> and Matt's like, it's fine. It's, it's okay. Nah, and it will, like, it's always a, it's always a risk. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, anytime I open my mouth, you need to run the risk that someone's going to say something. Yeah. So I guess in a more formal way, you really do, I set up my points and I like to try and be as well-spoken as possible. Um, but then also have honesty because I hate it when you watch famous people talk and you're like, this is just coming out of your ass. Like, you're mm. not actually saying anything that you mean. Mm. Um, but I th- so at the peak of my fame, I was about 16, which was really hard because I was going through puberty and figuring my own body out. And having, like, I'd go to Bondi Beach. And if I posted, like, a beach on my story, Paps would then come and be there. 
So it was having to be so aware of myself at that young age was really tricky. And then, you know, like bikini pictures. And then it was hard for me. Like I wasn't aware of my body yet or the power it held or that it could be seen in a sexual light. And so to have that so directly just shone on me. And even earlier, 13, 14, 15, 16, like especially at 13. And then, you know, seeing it on the Daily Mail cover and being like Mm -hmm. Olivia Diebel, new to home and away, shines in a bikini. And it was like... That's really unfair. And then, you know, you read the Daily Mail comments from all the old people being like, she's fucking fat, isn't she? And bullshit like that. Mm. It's really hard for your mentor. And then being so overtly sexualized, like there's awful like Reddit accounts of me. There's like fanfic. Um, and, you know, they always say don't read it. But, of course, you do just in case something really awful is out there so you know. Um, and then I think the hardest part was that that was kind of consistent. And I was like, this happens to all like young women. It's awful. It's disgusting. But I'm going to move forward as a power. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't own me the things that they're calling me isn't me but then when I turned 18 and like became my own sexual being and you know cut my hair or like wore what I wanted to wear or de- dress how I wanted to dress then got so intensely slut shamed by who just like comments on Instagram or by daily like by um magazines and things like that do you think that was because they saw you as like this um like Australia's sweetheart child actor and then you'd become an adult and they were like oh it's almost like they're not giving you autonomy to become an adult. It's Precisely. like up to the media and yeah. up to, Precisely. you know, those individuals. So I think, yeah, I think it's the two things of one of it being, you know, Australia's sweetheart and then, oh, maybe she's like, she's, it's, but it's ridiculous. It's actually just that I cut my hair or stopped wearing dresses or I don't know. Like then these really like gender eccentric roles that then I wasn't fitting into. Um, and then I think all of it, it's just that gross little control thing that like as soon as you put a pretty kid into the stars, everyone thinks that they're theirs. And then when they create autonomy over themselves like ah, uh, 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 we get to tell you when you can grow up which is fucking ridiculous but did your parents guide you with that like i'm sure because if your mum was an actress and again your grandfather were they giving advice throughout that process yeah. of how to get through that yeah press is very different now though and like so you think of how many articles come like it's not a paper it's all online it's very easy so it's all like just and then there's so many trash mags there's so many just like Tabloid. Headline, head, yeah, tabloid kind yeah. of bullshit that it's hard to Even navigate. Even Instagram pages where it's like someone will have like 20,000 yeah, followers just and they so just they're post. just talking shit on click, people. Yeah, clickbait, yeah. just influencer So stuff. I had a media manager, Benji Hart, for a little bit kind of at the peak and that was really good because he would manage awesome articles for me and culminate. And then it kind of flowed really easily into then Disney. And I think like everyone in Australia ate that up. Of course, you know, it's went from home and away to Disney. Of course, <laughs> oh, it's, we did it again, guys. <laughs> we got the white girl on Disney. <laughs> All of Australia. So you shook felt like their Australia hands. was patting themselves on the back for your yeah. success. Yeah. And well, then, <laughs> I mean, I think I was really lucky then when quarantine hit. I then got to do all my changes when I wasn't in the limelight, like cutting my hair and figuring out all this shit about myself or, you know, then solidifying the kind of person I wanted to be. And the aesthetic I wanted to hold as well has really drastically yeah. changed. Not that that even matters, but like, you know, Instagram aesthetics suddenly really matter to everyone as well. Um, so I think it was actually really good for me that I wasn't working, <coughs> that I wasn't working or that I wasn't in the limelight during that time because then I got to really solidify who I was and then I was writing the show, obviously, in quarantine during that time. And it just gave me a real opportunity to step back and, like, rebuild myself or re-kind of center myself and have new armor and then be like, okay, this is who I am now. This is who I'm going to present as. Um, and that's kind of it. And you guys don't have, a, have to have discussion about it. So I really valued those two years in quarantine and it, I needed it. I think if I didn't have it and I was still under pressure in, in, in the on the screen, like, I probably wouldn't be as strong as I am today or my mental health wouldn't be as great because I would still consistently be met by criticism and judgment. So, yeah. So that was a conscious decision where you said, okay, this is who I was before and now I'm going to use these two years to kind of, like, I guess build up yeah, armour. Yeah, redevelop in a myself, way. yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. also quite normal for someone your age yeah. to do. Going through changes. Yeah. Especially. I, it wasn't, like, particularly conscious, but then I guess when I started getting tabloid articles written about me about the changes I was making, I was like, okay, well, I very, like, not knowingly made myself change because I was just developing like normal people do. And then from there I was like, okay, no, we're going to run with this and we're going to culminate it. And then it has worked really well for more than this. Like, it's kind of – I've been – uh, people are seeing me in a really different light which is lovely and really nice and I feel smarter I guess that's been a real noticeable shift I've had is that people are taking me seriously as a as a woman not just as this pretty thing that can act and that's been so wonderful they've gone oh wow she's intelligent and she's able to culminate information and make art out of it and put it on a platform and it's the first time I think in my career I've been I felt like I've been listened to or when I'm being interviewed 
or ask things. People are asking me about my opinion or my brain, mm. not if I think I'm fat or skinny or not if I am happy being an actor. So that's been really affirming. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly mad at, at quarantine. I think I really owe a lot to my mental stability or re-evaluation of myself in that. Yeah, so I came back from America and had just done so many auditions of, like, <laughs> the same kind of cookie-cutter white a stupid American blonde girl who's like really mean but like really stupid and then at the end she's like maybe I need to open my mind and she's just like oh my god and I had a really like freak out moment I was like is this what I'm gonna do like and then you know when I get to 25 and I look too old then just do guest appearances is that like is this my trajectory for my career and I had a bit of a freak out you had a moment where you thought this could be well it was I, I did like a hundred auditions of wow. that yeah and still to this day like the exact I still same character Pretty much. And, like, different. She was either the mean girl or the, like, surprisingly smart girl because she was pretty or, like, didn't know she was pretty. Like, just the same trope in the same high school kind of experiences, which is fine. There's definitely a market for that. I'm happy to still do that. It makes money. And my job as an actor is to make my characters interesting and have depth. That's my job. But I was like, no one's making things, at you know, that I found interesting or stuff that I really, really, really wanted to do. So... That kind of started it. I was like, I'm not writing anything that feels real. For, well, no one's writing anything that feels real. Um, and then, you know, kind of over lockdown, had rewatched Skins and stuff like that. And then came to my friend Luca, who's trans and binary, who has been my, like, lifelong friend. And I was like, I want to make a show that's, like, about teenagers in Australia. And we don't have the nerdy, the sporty, the chess club kind of whatever we have because like you don't really have clicks in australia yeah like you don't like there are there's like sure you have the popular group yeah and yeah you might have the sporty boys but then they'll hang out with the kid who likes to do woodwork or something you know it's not like there's the emo the jocks yeah. it's not like 21 jump street no. australian high school yeah at all, is it? yeah no we I never don't thought about that we don't really have those subcultures at all, at at all. like i guess you know you have like I, I, they're definitely uh, like groups of people but people disperse and do lots of different things and they come together because they like each other not because they're interested in the same things mm. um and so i wanted to make something like that and then luca had kind of come up so, and then we went well we definitely want it to be queer as well um but not that kind of we wanted almost like a dystopian future of the things that they go through isn't because they're gay they're not depressed because they're gay they're depressed because they have an eating disorder do you know what i'm saying mm. so it was about then normalizing the queer community and saying no we're stepping forward that being queer is normal and is equal but we all going through shitty things Oh, that was gross. <laughs> <laughs> so disgusting. <laughs> so, it's so much snot. It was very amplified as well. Yeah, in both of our mics. <laughs> the subplot is just me sniffing and coughing out to it. After this, I'm like, we've got 10 I good minutes. I'll tell, tell, tell you what, you've got some not, good fucking content it lives, in here. It leaves nostrils. <laughs> it's just me coughing. And <laughs> the <laughs> Daily Mail leaves <laughs> nostrils. <laughs> Olivia's sick. <laughs> um, COVID, she can't mark. keep her hygiene in check. Um... So then we, <laughs> we, I came up with the kind of, we came up with the five main characters and kind of what we wanted them to be. And then we interviewed maybe like a hundred kids over lockdown. Where did you find Luca these and kids? I, I kidnapped them. <laughs> and then I just put a call out on my Instagram. I was like, who wants to chat to me about being a high teenager? Um, and then we DMs. Just got DMs. I'm, I'm very famous. I'm very popular. <laughs> Lots of people. I forgot you were in Home and Away. You're lucky yeah. to actually be <laughs> speaking with me. Very popular. <laughs> Didn't even need to DM me. Well, you did on TikTok. Yeah. Um, it's a new kind of DM TikTok. It is. I'm so bad at... Anyways. <laughs> shut up. Let me talk about we my show. Not, let me come on and talk about my plug. Can I talk about me for a second? <laughs> Go ahead. By all means. Um, so what makes you happy? My name's Fergus Neal and I have a dream. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Fergus Neal. Anyways, so more than this. Um, so interview like... I'm going to... If you interrupt me, I will forget I, what I will I'm not, saying. Okay, I won't interrupt anymore. That wasn't aggressive. It's oh, just no. we're not. You're not going to have any stuff to make. Uh, no, I cheated chess clubs. So I'm just feeling <laughs> all right. You, you and your chess club jittering is really important to fundamental Australia. More I than this. More than your chess club is more than this. Your chess ambitions. It's more than that. This is the last podcast ever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I interviewed about 100 kids online, Luca and I. We just did Zoom saying, what do you want to see on screen? What makes, like, what do, you, what do you identify with? What have you had to go through, like, doing high school on lockdown? And we got, like, a great reaction and kind of exactly what we were like. Okay, great. We're not, it was almost affirming. We went, we're not crazy. People want to see this. People want, th people want things to be made like this. Great. Then I had written, I kind of did it like a Mike Lee kind of film, like, do you know what I'm saying? And then I wrote it and then we did a six-month process and I cast all my actors. Um, it, well, like, we did a workshop to pretty much say, okay, 
here's can you guys just speak to me how you normally would as young people teenagers and this was like in the in a meet in a break in one of our lockdowns so I got like maybe 20 kids and then I got them all to impro and filmed it all and then from there I started yeah. writing so it was because my main ambition for all of this is to have an authentic teen voice and I'm not a typical normal teenager you know and i I've been taught to speak well and, 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 you know, present myself as an adult to be taken seriously. But I was like, that's not a real authentic teen story. So I, yeah, got a bunch of teenagers in the room and we filmed it. And then I kind of started writing from there. And actually in that first audition, we cast most of our main cast, except for Camille Ellis, who plays Alex. Yeah. Everyone else was pretty much cast. Yeah, from there we just did a writing structure and it maybe took me like, less than a year to write. It kind of then took off from there and we filmed it really quickly, like in five weeks. And our, wow. our casting crew were really small. Um, like it was really, really small um, and done really, really quickly. Um, but again, I think that gave it... Have you watched it? Yeah, I watched the first okay. three episodes. Yeah. You didn't watch my episode. Did you? <laughs> Thanks. No, that's fine. I'm going to finish it. Okay. I really love it. I really enjoy it. Thank you. It. I'm glad you no, like genuinely, it. Genuinely, I really, really <laughs> love it. Thank you. I, that's what I was fishing for. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for catching on. Um, yeah, I watched it um, over the last two weeks. Mm. I've just come home from a comedy mm. gig and I just chuck it on. Yeah. I put it on. So um, it and it's authentic, like yeah, you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And you can tell, like, it's really small and, like, super just a couple of cameras. Like, you know, I had two cameras and our crew was really small. But the beautiful part about it, from pre production to post to release, everyone had a queer element. So a lot of the crew's children were either like, we, you know, it was beautiful having these like big blokey men come up and be like, yeah, my uh, my child's going through transition and it's turned, it is, is now a girl and this has been really like, we got to educate then old people on the set as yeah. well who were going through it or like, you know, our costume designer was gay and he was like, this is so like, makes me feel so happy that I'm part of something that's like this. So it was really affirming and beautiful how many people along the way were able to share and contribute their stories and it be a safe space and it be really authentic. I think it was a bit weird. Had to film a sex scene where my mum directed. I heard about that. That was interesting. Yeah, I was kind of umming and ahhing whether to bring that up. I thought if you brought that up, I'd talk about <laughs> you it. But talk I'm about not going to bring that up on my own volition. It was hot. It was crazy. <laughs> um, another really important factor into my show was that we had an intimacy coordinator. I don't know if you know what those. I've never had one. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. Um, <laughs> it's because again, I wanted to also show sex authentically on the show, or show yeah. how, like you know, with Zali and the self harm scars, and showing that that's mm. okay, and that things can be really sensual, and that we don't hyper sexualize. Like the thing I don't mess with you for how over sexualized they sexualize teenagers yeah. having ki- yeah. teenagers having sex. Like teenagers do have sex, but it's not for anyone else to watch and be like, yeah, that's hot. Two mm. kids having sex. Yeah. It's about, you know, the two energies that they share and, and, and figuring out their own sexuality with two partners is really beautiful if they're of age and of consent. So an intimacy coordinator is just the two actors, the director and the intimacy coordinator in the room and they meet and they have to ask for consent before they hug. Then they ask for consent to kiss and then they talk through the sex scene. Then they act it out like miming, not properly touching. And then they fully act it out. Is this common practice? It's starting to be. It still kind of isn't yet, but um, that was the first time I've had one, but it was fantastic. Um, my mum had had one on a TV show she was on, and she was like, this is awesome, we need this. Um, I think Neighbours have them, because we got Eve, who plays, who also was, um, the intimacy coordinator was Jamie's mum. Okay, She's a yeah. spectacular actress as yeah. well. But having that level of um, kind of, that practice for the sex scene, because I've definitely been put in positions with shows that they're like, okay, you, need, you now need to do this. And it's like, I'm, I'm fine to do it, but having the rehearsal space mm. or just like someone rehearsing it with me so it's like a dance. Because yeah. a lot of time then you get on set and the director's like, take your job off or something like this. And it's like, well, no, I wasn't ready for that. So having an intimacy coordinator, it's like you run it through like a dance and it won't change. That then is that. No matter what the director wants, no matter what, you guys are all sitting in that space. And it takes away the sexual nervousness of it. Yeah. And that yeah. was really helpful for a lot of our cast who, you know, sometimes like, sometimes it was the first time I've ever on set, like, um, Zali, that was her first time ever acting. Really? That's the first thing she'd ever done, yeah. And She's Lu- great. Amazing. And Luca the same. So having that intimacy call, and we did it with all the kisses as well. Mm. Then it's like a dance and it takes away that, almost that pizzazz out of it or the um, nervousness or intimacy because then you've rehearsed it and it's just like a dance or and it's like And you know like what's going to happen as well. It's exactly. not like just the director saying, do this now. Yeah. And you're going, oh God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Yeah. yeah. And then you've rehearsed it so many times. And then even before you get on set, all the crew leaves. It's just the director, intimacy coordinator and you and, the, and then you rehearse it again in the space as well. So that was really awesome. Um, I guess because I've been put in positions where I, ha- where I haven't had one before, it was really nice for me to have it. But I don't think it particularly changed it. But I definitely think for some of the uh, other cast members, it was really helpful for them because then it was just, okay, I'm kissing one, two, three, four, break away, kiss again. They could see it in the steps and the timing. Mm -hmm. So it's not then about 
how intensely passionate it is and you get the same effect. Do you think that'll start a precedent in Australian television? I really hope so. I really, really hope so. I think it's really important. Like, um, especially for me as a young woman and I'm doing sex scenes or doing sexual things, it's just nice to know that I have that. Um, I have like a person who literally is just looking after me. They don't give a fuck about mm. what I'm making. And yeah. then we've rehearsed it. And then there's just someone in my corner going, that's not what we were fucking rehearsed. That was a really interesting component that I would, li- that I, I think is imperative. I don't mm. understand how in this modern day age, uh, especially after the Me Too movement and why stuff like that, been why it hasn't just become a rule. And uh, I get annoyed. I, I'm someone who thinks art is, imbu- is beautiful and I push myself in scenes to a point where then I need to sleep for like 12 hours. But there also needs to be a level of safety. Mm. Like it's okay. Our job as actors are to pretend we're meant to make you believe that this is what we're feeling. So going full on method and having like a genuine sex scene that potentially isn't even necessary mm. isn't, I think is ridiculous. Like my job as an actor is to make you feel like I'm feeling what I'm really feeling, yeah. but I'm not. And so it's, I, get a, I get a little bit annoyed when the lines, especially around safety or consent or push how far you'll push someone to get that shot, I think is really gross. Well, I think that's what came out of the Me Too movement as well. Like you see people like James Franco and they've kind of talk about him directing and being so – it's so hard to find the right word because, like, it always sounds underwhelming, but just, like, you know, forcing people to do scenes they probably didn't want to do. Yeah. But they felt it's James Franco. They felt there's a person in power of authority. Also, you know, when you're aware that on set, like, um, especially with big productions, they're blowing, like, $500,000 a day. And if you're, like, an hour – if you push the show an hour because you don't want to do a shot, they're losing $100,000. Mm. It's like a $100,000 gun to your head kind of going, like – you fuck this up because you didn't want to do it. So, of course, you're going to do it for a shot. And you're like, what's my big chance? So, there's just the, am- the amount of pressure in the arts is crazy. And, again, we, we want to do things for our craft as well. So, it's, it's really hard to say no. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be a good actor if you're feeling uncomfortable because you're actually taking yourself out of the scene. So, I think that getting intimacy coordinators is really, really um, – it's just so important. So you're 19 years old and you've achieved probably what, you know, a lot of actors and actresses would want to achieve within a whole career, you know, <laughs> looking back. I think it's similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you feel like you are looking towards the future as like hopeful and like something that oh, I want to keep doing acting or is it kind of like, oh, I've done this and I've achieved what I wanted to do and now I'm going to go <laughs> live gonna in go the hills farming. of Nimbin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I think it's just the beginning for me. I definitely had like a, a bit of an ego death, um, probably like last year or started this year. Like I put a bit of weight on and that's always been a real struggle because I fluctuate so frequently, like losing weight for roles or putting it on or then like what my, I've or just not like working out healthily as well. So I think because I was fluctuating a little bit with that, which again is normal, I'm 19, I'm meant to lose and put on weight. My body's figuring out what it's meant to do. But, you know, an internal thing that freaks me out and then, COVID has brought auditions back, like COVID now, like you can still do auditions, but there's all this like visa stuff and it's really tricky. Like me being in Australia is a deficit. Unfortunately, if I want to go to America and I wasn't getting shit, I was like, fuck, like what if I don't make it? Like what if I had my moment? Um, And then I kind of just took myself back and went, it's okay. Like it's, again, I am so young and I've got time and I will, and again, it's a put. I don't necessarily massively believe in manifestation and things like that, but I definitely think if you have an outlook on life, you're going to attract more things if you're positive and you're going, I'm, no, I'm going to do it because essentially your subconscious will just work harder. It's mm. not like a magical thing that happens, but if you have confidence in yourself, you'll then drive yourself to do more. Um, but it's opened up a world of writing opportunities and I'm getting excited about writing more things. I want to write more things. I want to do a skit. Um, don't steal my copyright idea. <laughs> Maybe you'll come in with me. <laughs> Have you seen Bugsy Malone? Yeah, yeah. I want to do like a Bugsy Malone, but in, in Parliament. Okay. So like the younger they are, the height, like ScoMo is like five. Yeah. And so it's just like this real Aussie You're satire. You're not a fan? I love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Oh, fine. I told you I can say anything political. I think in trouble. I'm um, getting like weird stuff now where like uh, Dan Andrews and his wife will like follow me on Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. Like weird things where I have to be cautious that I'm well, not I representing do, a political yeah. party. I don't want to do that. Like as no. a comedian, you don't want to be like... But also tricky because a lot of your TikTok fame is culminated yeah, around the education yeah, doing, that yeah. you have for... <laughs> you set yourself up well though. I know. I've backed myself into a corner. But maybe Dan I? Andrews and his wife just want to laugh at the political slander you throw at people. They're big Steiner School fans. <laughs> Obviously. We get those sons on TikTok every three months. That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard because I feel I was, and this is the next question as well. Like um, I always 
want to be cautious, like backing myself into a corner. You know, you always want to keep like potential open. Yeah, um, or you know, your opinion may change. Like yeah. po- politics is also really hard. Like uh, th- as you frequently say, it's not. It's nothing is good or bad. Mm. And some things that some people do, you might agree with more than the party that you normally go for as well. Like it's a really tricky field. And at the end of the day, also the people within the parties are, can do fundamentally very wrong things. They'll let you down. <laughs> yeah. Shocker, guys. <laughs> I mean, look at the current state of the world now. I know it's crazy to believe that we've been disappointed by them, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you're like around um, like 19, 20 year olds, like mm. having grown up in the environment we have and kind of having the, you know, the twilight of your teenage years being through COVID and then obviously like the conflict happening in Europe. Like when I was 19, 20, like I was going to LMFAO concerts and I think I went to the Red Tour with that's Taylor Swift. That's very <laughs> political. Like, yeah, there was absolutely not. I, well, there must have been something. No, there really wasn't. It was like a peaceful paradise time <laughs> where we'd all run through the fields and drink oat milk. But <laughs> <laughs> does that affect it? Like, I think it's affected. the peers? Yeah, everyone's really scared. We're all just really scared. Oh we God. don't. <laughs> it's it's actually not doing super well. Like everyone I speak to, we're all really stressed. Yeah. Like teenagers, like the, I guess I I typically hang out with older, but still that would only kind of, I think so from like the nineteen to maybe like twenty three, twenty two, we're all really scared because like everything's more expensive. Mm. Um. There's no certainty for our future or what's going on. I think that the um the religious protection bill that just got passed, that was really scary for everyone. Yeah, and, like, yeah. everything that was going on with the, the schools in Queensland as well. Yeah. I think, no, so I don't think it's going very well. And mm. we always consistently feel pressure. Mm. Um, and it's really a shame. I think it it's, smart and it's smartening us up, though. Like, we're prepared to be adults very early on because we have to make these decisions that then could potentially affect us. And I guess we also don't feel any support from the government either. A, because we don't have young representation and a lot of queer people don't feel that there's any kind of representation like having a man say i don't know i feel bad for everyone is not the same as a queer person saying this is what's happening in parliament this is how it's affecting us um so i think there's a lack of representation people don't necessarily feel secure because you know one party will promise us something and then not do it Mm. um and so yeah i guess there's a lot of fear centered around it and a lot of loss and then it's also hard to keep up with politics as well like i try my best to and my you know my dad's an educated political person, so we kind of have a lot of conversations about it, as does my sister, but it's hard of your own volition as a young person to consistently check the news and see what people are doing for you to then formulate your opinions, but then not piss anyone off with those conversations, but yet just keep updating yourself. Like, it's a really hard practice to keep knowing what's going on in Australia. So it's o- it's almost as well. I feel like with the religious discrimination bill, because I got introduced to it by a friend, Christian Hull, who's a comedian, yeah. and he was kind of getting all the messages about it, and he was kind of at the forefront. I think he was almost like he definitely was, like he was a real beacon yeah, for a lot of people, yeah, using his platform for that. And then um, I think you kind of get introduced to things by the people you know, you know. Yeah, and then what's tricky about that is it's fantastic because then if you if it's someone you know, you probably have the same views as them, but then also you're only getting that you or the yeah. the information that's passing through that and then so you don't get an open display of what's going on you're just hearing someone's doing something shitty that's going to fuck everything up and then you're like what the fuck and it's hard because then you're not actually properly and like i think that's fine and, and politics is all really propaganda and opinions so it's not <laughs> too bad but i guess the thing that my dad taught me i really taught me well is like don't speak on it until you know everything, mm. you know? Or, like, when, when movements happen and I'm like, oh, I really want to post about it. He's like, well, read everything you can. Choose a donation. Choose a charity that you want to donate to and then speak on it. So then you have a really formulated opinion and it's not just because you've heard someone else's secondhand propaganda that's making you make that decision. That's interesting. And I think that's a good point for yeah. everyone. Because you can, you can upset people with and propaganda or, or and especially because polls or like shit mm. just gets sh- like you think of how uh, uh, so many algorithms and then so many people just share the same posts and then you yeah. actually read it and you're like this isn't the information you think it is you've just seen every other influencer post it and so you all think it's fine <laughs> so that was a really good tip for me of read everything choose an opinion for you it's fine to have for you to have an opinion but actually have it as because it's an educated formulated opinion that you have and then you can go and speak about it are you cautious putting out like viewpoints on politics? Like I know you have a platform, yeah. And I, again, you said that your dad says make sure you look like over these things forensically. But is there a pressure? Like you're like, if I put this out and it's wrong, yeah, does that affect my future potential to yeah, either absolutely. get roles absolutely. or writing opportunities? I don't. Or I don't think it affects roles and writing opportunities. I okay. think they're really separate. I guess it, it it ruins the perception of what my fans or audience think of me. 
And like I get definitely like in the climate change, I lost a bunch of followers. Really? Yeah, or in the female like in the movement like kind of any because I, I think my my biggest political thing that I talk about is like women's rights and, and equality in general. Uh, as a woman, I think that's because I feel the most comfortable speaking on that because it is something that directly affects me. Um, yeah, those were my two that hated climate change, hated the women's movement. So I you just said, hey guys, like let's. Well, <laughs> just like I or I guess when I try to talk about things online, I also will do a video and be like, mm. hey, here's what's happening. Here's how what I think of it. Yeah. Just so then it's a more direct, and then I'm directly explaining my thoughts. Um, do you have to put that through like a, a management or publicist, or do you? Just I go normally check again. I really respect and admire my father and he's done mm. so kind of a multitude of things and he works with the government or the parliament a lot yeah. that I would like to run through him because I just think he's such a well-spoken and thought out man and mm. if he goes no I think this is politically correct for you to post then I'm like great and then um that but that's I that's great to have that in your yeah, life so, a lot of people oh, don't have that it's great it's and it's really helped me kind of speak well um and say direct things and he's 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 an awesome man I'm very lucky for both of my parents it's kind of put, it's put me into the perfect tour guide because I've got like the politically <laughs> correct side and then that lovely performative side for my mother and I'm just here. <laughs> so it's great. Someone's like spoon fitting me all these words. I did, <laughs> none of this is actually my opinion. Um, well, I thought you might come with like a publicist or someone. Like I thought, because I've had even um, people in the podcast who um, they don't have as big platforms as you and they've arrived, you know, with two publicists or someone like something like that, or they've had management come and I've asked a question and they've been in the background. just like, so I thought it's possible, you know, but you were like, but can you pick <laughs> me up from the, the train, train station? station. <laughs> I was like, what? I guess it, I think I have that real thing of being the Aussie. The beautiful thing about Aussies kind of across the board is how authentic they are and open they mm. speak. Yeah. And I like that about myself. I like that I can, you know, sit down and ask you to pick me up from the train station <laughs> and be like, because I, I guess there's a real, I, I, think it's all, I, th I think it's also funny. It's like, yeah. Jesus Christ, this kid <laughs> like, funny. I've got an apartment. I bought an apartment yet can't drive and have to take two tramps and a bus and get very lost. Like, that's a funny duality you for me You got sushi on the way. It's not like had an adventure. <laughs> well, I, the sushi was nice until the man <laughs> threw up. Anyways, that's a whole other story. It's a tangent. Um, and I guess it's, nothing's got, I don't know. You're very relaxed. Yeah. You're very down to earth, which is what I thought you'd be. Yeah. But I thought like, oh, there's potential, like, you know, you've, you've grown up in yeah. the acting fraternity, yeah. been on massive shows. Yeah. There's potential, you know, that um, there's a, a just a, a, a wall in front yeah. of you. I think what realistically will happen is <laughs> like probably you'll edit this together. I'll send it off to the more than yeah, this publicist. Yeah. If there's anything, they don't really care about me. And I don't have a lot to, I just kind of swear a bit, really. That's all that's, yeah. and then that's. You've never done anything controversial where it's been like. No. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, I just, I didn't think that was, I didn't think it was worth it. And I no. didn't, I didn't need to rebel enough, I guess. Yeah. But I also, I, I really want to preface, I, yes, I was famous, but I think when I went to America and being around these kids who were like next level famous, I'm actually not. And I'm really okay with that. I have after you don't coming strive back, for fame. Uh, uh, well, I used to, and then okay. after coming back from America, well, I, I was just young, and I was so I was like, everybody should love me. <laughs> then after coming back from Australia, I was like, fuck that. Just they just seem so sad and scared and stressed, and they all kind of just stick in the same bubble, and it just seems it just seems really stressful. And I also don't want that high horse. I want to be proud of myself because I'm a talented actor and writer. I don't want to be proud of myself because lots of people like me mm. and they don't actually like me because my job is to lie to them do you know what i'm saying yeah so i'd much prefer to be really open and comfortable and then have people come up to me and be like you're amazing because you do this thing not because i don't know i saw you on a tv show and i liked you and then that's why or because you did a brand deal that i liked that made they you like famous. your work yeah and that's what i want to be known for my craft mm. i'm okay to not be a socialite because again i catch trains and not like i don't want people to follow my way of living <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> explain <laughs> I think I'm just still figuring crap out. Like I'm, I'm a you know I'm a 19 year old who like lives with three housemates <laughs> who are all my best friends. I woke up at like 10:30, drank a coffee, fell back asleep for 30 minutes. You know, <laughs> a lot of the time it's ravioli and like tin, but like it's not. Do I you hang out with other famous Australians? Like are your housemates? Like not really. Yeah. Okay. No, I. Is that I think weird for them? Because I imagine then they'd be out with you and they'd be like, um. They're all in the arts. I think it's really – I don't particularly care about fame. I mm. care if you are creative or in the yeah. arts because so much of my passion centres around that. Yeah. So my housemate Celine is Allegra. 
yep. ex who yeah, hates wow. me in the show. Yeah, <laughs> and is also my best friend. That's cool. Yeah, it's really funny. And then my <laughs> other housemate, um, Ruby, is a photographer. So we're all very in the arts. And I've culminated a really good little friendship for myself in Melbourne um, who are all like uh, either established or, ins- or um, trying to be established artists mm. in whatever medium that is. And that's lovely because it's just a supportive space. I definitely think, and I, like, I'd like to be friends with you. <laughs> I'd like to come <laughs> hang out with your friends because I really want to. Do you know many comedians? More in Sydney. Yeah, okay. More in Sydney. Oh, well, yeah, we talked about that yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then Melbourne. But I really want to get mm. into... <laughs> I don't think I necessarily want to get into comedy because, again, I think... Would you do stand-up ever? You're very funny. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really <laughs> appreciate that. I think I'm quite funny. Um, no, not yet. Like, I think people would think I'm funny, but the beauty about... Like, I, I, I would want to be a stand-up comedian that was a storyteller, which mm. most stand-up comedians are. Yeah. And the stories I have are ridiculous and funny, but I would lot of people so the interesting thing with like i'm doing a gig on saturday with um celia Paquala. she's a stand-up but she also does acting like mm. a lot of it's often like a lot of stand-ups will do stand-up because stand-up's fun but there is an element that is i'm sure it's the same of acting maybe i'm being biased but it's very, quite taxing in the sense that you're performing stand-up comedy is taxing if they don't laugh yeah or if no you do a set where you're like, i definitely I'm, that I'm also scared that like I really derive my humour from laughs. And I think, mm. like, again, taking it back to a little, or just comedy, like, from my grandfather, when people laugh, then you're like, okay, this angle works, I'm going to go with this. Yeah, and yeah. I think if I confine myself to a script in comedy and then people weren't getting laughs, I'd freak out and then I'd bomb. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd need a first laugh in the first yeah. five minutes and then I'd be fine. Bombing is so humbling. I think it's good for you to bomb. <laughs> there are some places where you can't bomb. Like, there are some comedy clubs, like, like Comedy Republic where there's like 200 mm. people. It's very – you'd have yeah. to say something heinous yeah. for them to hate you. Like they've already paid. Yeah. They're in a club yeah. on a Saturday. They're drunk. They want to love you. Yeah. You'd have they to say – s- They you. do though. Yeah. They're like, their eyes are like this. Like they're like smiling. Say something fake. Come on. <laughs> give me anything. <laughs> <laughs> what I always ask guests is are you happy? I think you asked me like maybe three weeks ago I would say no. I am very happy at the moment now. Which is nice. So, yes, I am. Um, I feel like all of my relationships in my life are good at the moment. Um, yeah, the show's doing really well. I've had a lot of interest as a writer, which is really new for me. I didn't think that would happen. I didn't. I think they'd think, oh, that's an amazing show. Well done, her. She's going to keep acting now. But I've, like, book, like, people are asking me to write books now and people are asking me to write other – and that's so affirming and makes me feel really good and happy. Um, yeah. No, I'm happy. What happened? So why not three weeks ago? Oh, I just was. I think I wasn't. I didn't have a lot of money at that point. Like I'd kind of was stressing, and then had to. I had to like fucking. I don't know. Being I, being a house owner is scary. Like you have to pay yeah. body corporate, and yeah. I have to like fix things, and like I have to pay the bills, and I don't like it. And so I think I get all this adult stress from being an adult of like having to pay these consistent bills. As a 19 year old. Yeah, like I'm a landlord at 19 and that's <laughs> crazy. Um, <laughs> and I guess like mental health kind of comes in waves and I wasn't, I was having some pretty crazy body dysmorphia at that point, which kind of hits me really bad and then I can't. And it's hard having body dysmorphia as like an actress mm. or as because then you're in front of a screen, sometimes not wearing a lot. And so having that kind of, you have to just remember that that's not real. Um, and I was pretty sick. Um, and my like apartment was a, I hadn't cleaned it properly, and like I hadn't, I just kind of wasn't super in a good looking after yourself. Yeah, I was I was in a bit of a rut, mm. which was fine, and I knew I'd get out of it. But no, I'm, I'm now. It's like I get really sad, then I'm like, okay, cool, and then I'll be like this for five weeks. <laughs> yeah, it actually doesn't sound very healthy. I think I'm that's surprised. kind of normal where people go through waves where you feel yeah, good and then and you, you feel, feel really shit. That, do you divorce it from your work? Like sometimes if I, I have like patches where I'm like, well, like I can't do bad on stage. Like I'll have stand-up. I my definitely. Can't, and then I have it. I'm like, I can't be funny. Yeah. Like, I definitely think all of my self-worth drives from my work. And I think that's, that's really bad. It's not and, good. But it's all act, like it's all people in mm. the arts, right? Like yeah. I think because my show's doing really well at the moment, mm. I've got all these opportunities. I'm like, I'm so happy. But then, yeah, I get really bad depression. when It's very <laughs> weird. It's like if an older comedian who's like, I won't say their name, but if they're whatever, like, you know, a household name, and they say, fuck, that was a great set. I'll be like, cool, cool. And then afterwards I'll be like, oh, my God. Yeah, I'll be like, oh, I'm, I'll be like, I'm fucking amazing. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I am. And then I'll wear it as a badge of honour. But then, like, if you see them again and they don't say hi, you're like, oh, he's lying to me. Um, I guess I think the reason we feel so strongly about our work or how it directly correlates to our mental health is because we're doing our dream jobs, right? Mm. Like we broke the system. We're not sure, working sure. a nine to five. Yeah. Except for your chest tutoring. But that's really important to you. And I <laughs> that was in 2016. <laughs> shh, shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people watch more than this? You can watch it on Paramount Plus. It's out now. There's a seven day free trial, so you don't even need to pay for it. And it's easy to binge. Don't do what Fergie does and only watch three episodes. <laughs> I'm going to watch the rest tonight.
you're fucking better. I swear to God. Um, Can I just say for listeners, um, I don't usually watch television. I'm not a big TV watcher. And I loved this series. Oh, the first three episodes, I loved it. And I find it much. often I find it hard to watch television series. I don't know why. It's just something. It sounds so unpretentious, but I'm a, I'm a book reader. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's even worse. But I yeah, loved it. Reader. I've loved the first Thank three episodes. So I loved it. Um, and I can't see that changing after the last three episodes. Thank if it you. does, I'll make an emergency <laughs> podcast of just me. Just like Midstone. It's shit. Anyways, <laughs> enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> no, I really appreciate that. I'm glad you liked it. Um, awesome. Well, it's been lovely to meet you. I think it's been an hour and a half, which has been great. It has. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Olivia Debo, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>